Goodness. Oh my goodness, sorry. Never mind, this piano went crazy. <laughs> Thirty-two, seventeen says, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. James 4, 12 says, There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. Now all glory to God who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Ephesians 3.20 
this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. Good morning, church family. Good morning. That sounds great. Everyone feeling good today? Yes, sir. Great, great. I tell you, what a, what a wonderful thought it is that we come together as brothers and sisters, assemble in front of an awesome God. And every time I hear awesome God, it just really uh, makes me be thankful that, uh, that he's there for me and you and the whole world if everyone would just accept God is exactly who he is. We uh, have a, a prayer request. I want to call your attention to the uh, bulletin that you had, was received, that you receive every Sunday. There's some uh, names in here, intercessory prayer list. I'd like to ask you if you would to uh, take a look at those. Some of those names uh, you will know, you'll recognize those individuals. Some of them you may not recognize, and I would ask you to make an inquiry. Uh, they are friends or relatives or associates of some member that's had an issue or had a problem, and certainly it was a, a problem that really uh, would need some, some prayers, and thus their names on this list. But I would ask you to uh, uh, look at that and consider that as uh, part of your daily prayers, uh, those individuals on our intercessory prayer list here. Uh, Tanya Long had uh, asked that uh, we have her uh, son's father-in-law in prayer, that uh, he's uh, in the hospital, he has a possible broke, he's going to need a, a stent in there, that uh, he's uh, had some problems, blood work issues that needed some further, further uh, uh, address. Anyway, uh, before we go to the prayer of people, I'd like to take a moment, ask each one of us maybe to take a little time and do an individual prayer. Give some thought to those things that's important to you and just do a personal prayer here before we go to our prayer of the people here this morning.
Our Father in heaven, most holy is your name. And we humble ourselves before you this morning as your servant to give thanks to you for the blessings that you bestow upon us. Lord, we're indeed thankful for the creation, the creation that provides us the blue skies and the rain that comes to us, the flowers, the things that we see in the springtime as we approach summer, the warmth that we've recognized. Lord, we ask you to be with us. Lord, we live in challenging times. We have difficult issues on a daily basis. Satan is everywhere that we we go. We confront him. But Lord, we have no fear. As you tell us, do not be afraid. We have an awesome God and here there for us. But Lord, we ask you to help us to remember that when we have these challenges, whether it be major, whether it be minor, whatever the concern might be that we have, to know there, Lord, that you are with us. Help us to be ever mindful, Lord, to come to you first in all things that we endure, all issues that we have to address. Lord, we know that we're in a country where has forsaken you in many ways. We ask you, Lord, to be with our administration, the presidential administration, those that govern us. And Lord, you have told us that we are to pray for those and we do, Lord. We seek direction from someone that perhaps resides in that government that understands, Lord, that you are there, that you are the one that's in charge, Lord, not some man-made organization, some government to take issue with, but, Lord, you are there, that we fall back on you for all the things that we need to do. Lord, we continue to pray for those that are ill, the sick, those that may be having financial problems. We know that it's been a challenge here with the economy and the way that's going. But Lord, we know that you're there to support us, to help us. Help us keep in mind, Lord, that you're just a prayer away. Give us the strength, the guidance that we need to make it through the day. We pray for your congregation. We pray for your church. We pray for the pastor, the lessons that will be taught, the words that he speaks. Help us to understand, to read the Bible, to follow your word and all the things that we need to do, Lord. Give us the strength. Help us that we go forth on a daily basis, recognizing opportunities to share your word with those that we may, may come in contact with, whether it be family, friends, or associates. Lord, we know that you're there for each and every one of us. Lord, as we depart here and go to our homes, Help us to be ever mindful, Lord, that you are there. Keep us safe. Deliver us from evil in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
As we gather around the table each Lord's Day, we're often reminded to examine ourselves, to make our hearts right, and to be ready to accept the Lord's um, elements in a worthy manner. And it got me to thinking about what the disciples did on that first Last Supper, when they met for the first time in that upper room. Judas had been called out that he was going to betray Jesus. They've already taken the Lord's Supper. They've observed the Passover. And this is what Luke writes immediately after they've observed the Passover. Then they began to argue among themselves about who would be greatest among them. Sounds just like us, doesn't it? We know Jesus isn't going to be here anymore. Which one of us is going to be the head, head cheese? Which one of us is going to be the head honcho? But then listen to Jesus. In this world, the kings and great men lorded over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. For I am among you as one who serves. If Jesus has created all things, and all things come to fruition through him, and he's going to be our servant, I think it would do us well to serve him as we come around this table this morning. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread and broke it. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this bread this morning. It represents the broken body of your son. Broken on our behalf, he took the punishment that we deserved to pay a debt that we could not pay. Lord, we thank you for his great sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Take and eat from this, all of you. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
After the meal, Jesus took the cup. He blessed it. Lord, we thank you for this cup of redemption. It represents the shed blood of your Son. The blood that gives us the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life with you in heaven. Lord, we thank you for that tremendous sacrifice and the forgiveness that comes with it. Lord, we just thank you and praise you in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. He took the cup and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, freely poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me.
Good morning. morning. I'm not a musician, so I don't know if they call that a bridge or a chorus or what part of the song that was, but can you think of anything better to be running after you than the goodness of God? We hear about bears running after us and all these other things, but (laughs) but but just get it get a picture in your mind of the goodness of God chasing you everywhere you go. Thank you all for that. I will be in Acts 19 this morning, uh, covering the first 20 verses of, of the 19th chapter. Luke writes, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? He asked, and they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years, so the people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, They were healed of their diseases, and evil spirits were expelled. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirits replied, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come into your word this morning, we give you honor and glory and praise for all things. And Lord, we just pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to receive what it is that you have for us this morning that we would be receptive to what you're teaching us, and Lord, that you would convict us in a powerful way to be better servants for you and to give you praise and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Three boys who lived in the same neighborhood got to bragging one day. None of the three could top the other two until they started bragging about their grandfathers. The first boy said, my grandfather was in the FBI and caught several famous criminals. The second boy said, oh yeah? Well, my grandfather was a military hero who saved his whole platoon from being captured by the enemy. The third boy said, that's nothing. My grandfather knew the year, month, week, day, hour, minute, and second that he was going to die. The first boy asked, really? The second boy asked, how did he know that? The third boy replied, the judge told him. (laughs) We've become a society that's fascinated by the astonishing and the unbelievable. We're enthralled by people who claim ability to predict the future. Amazing athletic feats and tremendous displays of strength capture our attention. In movies and television, we expect to see dazzling special effects and breathtaking stunts. We turn to talk shows and reality shows to see and hear about bizarre acts performed by people. We observe such things and we exclaim, wow, did you see that? Man, how in the world did they ever do that? Oh, that's just incredible. I can't believe anybody would try something like that. But yet if we would just take some time to look at the biblical records, 
will find that there's not one actual or simulated event in our technically advanced society that can even begin to stand beside the mighty works of God. In Genesis 1, God speaks the world into existence. In Exodus 14, God parts the Red Sea so the Jewish people can escape the Egyptian army. Joshua prayed that God would let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stayed in place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. And there are other scriptures that remind us of the power and the strength of God. Scriptures that show us the possibilities that exist when it comes to God and what he can do. Jeremiah prayed, O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Luke 18, 27 records Jesus' words, What is impossible for people is possible with God. And the Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesian church, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. One of the most important scriptural teachings that we can depend on, that we can lean on, that we can trust in, is that when things seem impossible and we cannot, God can. Verses 11 and 12 of our text this morning tells us that God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. God can perform extraordinary miracles for those who will trust him. And the first thing we need to point out is it's God who performs the miracles. The text says God gave Paul the power. The miracles didn't happen because of Paul, but because of God. Lots of times I've heard TV radio or t- heard radio or TV preachers say something like, if you'll just send me your money, I'll send you this pillowcase or this prayer cloth or this handkerchief. And if you'll just sleep on it or carry it around with you or hold it as you pray, you'll receive a miracle. Now that kind of thing makes me cringe. Because God doesn't sell miracles. God gives them out of his grace and his mercy. And another thing that makes me cringe is that these so-called preachers act like miracles happen because of their own abilities. Supernatural events occur through the intervention of two persons, God or Satan. Satan's supernatural acts are weak and faulty. They don't last, they fade over time, and they'll turn bad just like a rotting tomato. But God's miracles are perfect. They're permanent. And they don't fade. First John 4 verse 1 tells us, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. The second point brought out in this morning's text is that these miracles were unusual. Now I understand that miracles are unusual in themselves, but these were extraordinarily unusual. God does perform miracles, but these were different than ones that he normally performs. This particular type of miracle is only described in a few isolated incidences in the New Testament. One is the woman with the hemorrhage that was healed when she touched the hem of Jesus' garment. It happened again in Acts 5 when people would try to get passed over by Peter's shadow and be healed. But here in our passage this morning, it's important to remember two things. First, all of God's miracles are extraordinary because they happen outside of the natural ways of operation. And second, God also works through normal, ordinary processes. God will honor the dedicated work of physicians and other medical personnel in working miracles. And as we look at miracles in the Bible, God primarily used people to be the agents of those miracles. The church still ought to be a place of healing. The church should be a place where people who are afflicted with disease find comfort and help. Two basic kinds of disease are physical and spiritual. Natural processes many times determine physical disease. But spiritual disease is always caused by spiritual processes. Sometimes physical disease is determined by spiritual processes. But whatever the case, God can heal every manner of disease. 
Sometimes God uses that disease to teach us about himself and draw us closer to him. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about carrying around a thorn in the flesh. He had asked God several times to take it away, to heal the disease. And Paul reported that God had told him that he would leave it there to remind Paul that God's grace was sufficient for Paul's need. The most unused and unclaimed scripture passage in the New Testament is found in James chapter 5. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you've committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Who do most people want to come see them when they're sick? Who do they typically call when they want to get well? Who does this passage say to call? I wonder how many people have missed out on a blessing because they failed to heed this particular scripture. Note that this passage also covers both physical and spiritual healing. Physically, it says, the Lord will make you well. Spiritually, James says, if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. In our scripture this morning, people were not only healed of physical maladies, but they were also cleansed of evil spirits. Evil spirits aren't something we like to talk about, are they? Because they're scary and they make us think about those horror movies that we may have watched. Now, I used to enjoy watching a good horror movie. I would stay up late with my dad on Friday nights and watch some of the old Alfred Hitchcock classics or the Vincent Price movies. But there's two reasons I don't watch those much anymore. One is that Laurie doesn't like them. <laughs> and I subscribe to the happy wife, happy life theory. So there are some compromises that have to be made. But mainly, I started asking myself, why do you want to watch something that glorifies evil and makes it look cool? The Bible tells us that when Satan rebelled against God and tried to overthrow God, that God cast him out of heaven and that Satan took one-third of the angels with him. Those spirits who serve Satan like to inhabit and torment human beings because we are precious to God. Many times those spirits are present in someone's life because either consciously or subconsciously they've been invited in. Some people have consciously opened their lives to control by demonic spirits because they've taken part in the rituals of witchcraft or Satan worship. Others have unwittingly opened their lives to demonic spirit activity because of involvement in things that are forbidden to God's people, like astrology, psychics and mediums, Ouija boards, tarot cards. Many times these people are miserable and they just don't know why. They need to know that God can heal their lives and release them from spiritual bondage. God can perform extraordinary miracles for those who will trust him. And God can also punish those who only pretend to serve him. Look closely at what Luke writes in verses 13 through 16. A group of Jews traveling from town to town casting out ev evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation saying, I command you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. These guys weren't faith healers. They were fake healers. If they were around today, they could probably put on as good a show as any religious huckster that we have around. They acted like they knew Jesus, and they tried to operate like they knew Jesus, but the fact of the matter is that Jesus was no more part of their lives than an automobile was. They have had absolutely no concept about what an automobile was, and they had no concept as to who Jesus was either. They were hypocrites. Now Webster defines a hypocrite as a person who puts on a false appearance of virtue or religion, a person who acts in contradiction to his or her stated beliefs or feelings. In New Testament times, a hypocrite was an actor who changed roles by changing masks on stage to portray a different character. Even today, churches are filled with people who play like they are Christians. 
They attempt to operate like they're Christians, but they have no idea or concept of who Jesus really is because they don't have a relationship with him. Like these seven sons of Sceva, they can put on a pretty good show. Their faith is in the appearance they give and by the things they do. They know the hymns. They can quote Bible verses. They know when to stand up and sit down in a worship service. They come to church on a regular basis, and they might even hold an office or a title. They believe that all they have to do is just balance their bad deeds with their good deeds, and they're going to be all right. But their Christianity is really a sham. A man was looking for a job, and he noticed that there was an opening at the local zoo. So he inquired about the job and discovered that the zoo had a very unusual position they needed to fill. Apparently, the gorilla had died, and until they could get a new one, they needed someone to dress up in a gorilla suit and act like a gorilla for a while. All the person needed to do was just sit, eat, and sleep. I'm all in. His identity would, of course, be kept a secret. Thanks to a very fine gorilla suit, no one would ever figure it out. The zoo offered good pay for this job, so the man decided to do it. He tried on the suit, and sure enough, he looked just like a gorilla. They led him to the gorilla pen, and he took a position at the back of the pen and pretended to sleep. But after a while, he got tired of sleeping, so he walked around a little bit, jumped up and down, tried making a few gorilla noises. The people who were watching seemed to really like it, and when he would move or jump around, they'd clap and cheer and throw him peanuts. Well, this man really liked peanuts. So he jumped around some more, and he started climbing a tree. That seemed to get the crowd excited, and they threw more peanuts. So playing to the crowd, he grabbed a vine and swung from one side of the pen to the other. And the people loved it and threw more peanuts. The man thought, wow, this is great. He continued to swing on the vine, getting higher and higher, and all of a sudden the vine broke. He swung up and out of the gorilla pen and landed in the lion's cage next door. He panicked. There was a lion not 20 feet away and he looked like he was hungry. So the man in the gorilla suit starts jumping up and down, screaming, yelling, help, help, get me out of here. I'm not really a gorilla. I'm just a man in the suit. Help me. The lion pounced on him and the poor man in the gorilla suit. And the lion held him down and said through clenched teeth, Will you be quiet? You're going to get both of us fired. (laughs) (laughs) Now that illustration is a little bit far-fetched and a little bit corny. But this particular part of our text lets us know that it's a very dangerous thing to pretend to be something that you're not. We can't trust the devil. He'll beat us up and leave us bloody and confused. We can't trust ourselves. Our best attempts are feeble at best and hazardous at the worst. We can only trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus will not bless the fakers. Jesus will only bless the faithful. He won't give ultimate victory in this life to the fakers, nor will he give them eternal victory. Matthew 7 records Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who calls to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I'll reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. God can perform extraordinary miracles for those who will trust him. God can punish those who only pretend to serve him. And God can provide spiritual revival to those who submit themselves to him. Fear took hold of a large number of people who lived in Ephesus. And the name of Jesus was held in high honor because of what had happened. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to Jews and Greece alike. A solemn fear descended on the city and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them in a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars, so the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. Some people think we shouldn't use fear as an incentive for becoming a Christian. But Proverbs 1 verse 7 tells us, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. 
I think one of the problems of our current society is that we have lost our fear of the Lord. If we were convinced about what the Bible said is going to happen to those who refuse to acknowledge who God is, how holy God is, and how God's justice system works, we would spend a whole lot more time contemplating our eternal destiny. Verses 18 and 19 tells us, Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. When people in Ephesus operated their lives out of fear of the Lord, they gave up those things that kept them in the bondage of sin, and they were released to freedom from sin's control over their lives. But it was an expensive proposition. The value of all those things they gave up was 50,000 drachmas. Now, a drachma was Greek equivalent to one day's pay. So they gave up 50,000 days or 137 years worth of pay. According to the U.S. Census, the average individual income in Winchester for 2020 was $31,719. So in our current terms, the new believers in Ephesus gave up over $4 million worth of stuff to become followers of Jesus. Do you fear the Lord enough to give up $4 million worth of stuff to follow Christ? Most of us will give up some of our stuff, but we stop when it begins to hurt or when it causes us to change our social or economic status. You see, too many people want the comfort of knowing they'll never have to suffer in hell, but they don't want to give up those things to keep them separated from Christ. We want a casual Christianity that doesn't bother our conscience, a Christianity that doesn't impede our desires, a Christianity that doesn't prevent us from doing the things we want to do. Minister and author Wilbur Reese wrote, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or, disturb, or to disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me love a black man or pick beets with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not the new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like three dollars worth of God, please. Folks, the church has to be a place where people can be convicted of their sin. We don't need to backpedal, beat around the bush, talk around the subject, or be apologetic about the Word of God says about sin. What we need is to declare the whole truth by declaring the whole Word of God. Jesus said to the people who believed in Him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But the church also has to be a place where people can confess their sins. Spiritual healing and freedom cannot happen without the process of confession. Confession is an act of humility and submission. It says, I give up. I don't want to be a faker anymore. I don't want anything to come between me and God. For a church to be a place where sins can be confessed, we have to be a place where our concern for lost souls and our concern for those who are faking their Christianity overrides our pettiness and our snobbery. It was John Stott who said, The ministry to the brokenhearted is rooted in the ministry of the bleeding heart. When we fail to bleed, we fail to bless. A little boy visiting his grandparents was given his first slingshot. He took it out into the field on the other side of the woods next to his grandparents' house. He practiced and practiced with the slingshot, but he never could hit his target. As he came back into his parent, grandparents' barnyard, he saw Grandma's pet duck. And on an impulse, he took aim, let the rock fly, hit the duck right in the head, and fell over dead. The boy panicked. He desperately tried to hide the dead duck in a woodpile, but when he finished, he looked up, and there stood his sister. She had seen everything that took place, but she didn't say a word. After lunch, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. Sally said, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen today. 
Didn't you, Johnny? She leaned over to her brother and whispered, Remember the duck. So Johnny did the dishes. Later in the day, Grandpa asked the children if they wanted to go fishing. Grandma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help me make supper. Sally smiled and she said, That's all taken care of. Johnny wants to do it. And again she whispered, Remember the duck. Johnny stayed to help Grandma while Sally went fishing with Grandpa. Over the next several days, Johnny did all the work while Sally played. And finally, he couldn't stand it anymore, and he confessed to Grandma everything that had happened. Grandma said, I know Johnny, and gave him a big hug. I was standing at the kitchen window and saw the whole thing. But because I love you, I forgive you. I just wondered how long you would let your sister make a slave out of you. Maybe you're here this morning, and you have allowed certain things to make you a slave. It's kept you in physical and spiritual bondage for a long time. How much longer are you going to allow it to go on? For some of you, it might be a bottle of liquor, container of pills, or a bag of marijuana. Maybe for others, it's pornography and lust. Maybe it's past events in your life that you feel you have no control over, and it'll haunt you forever. Events that God has forgiven you of, but you haven't. Some of you are harboring hatred and resentment against someone who's harmed you at some point in time. Some of you have placed your trust in things that will fail you when you need them the most. But God's saying to you this morning, I love you. I'll give you forgiveness and healing. How long are you going to allow those things to hold you in slavery? I know you can't do anything about it, but I can Is there something in your life that you just can't overcome? God can. We have to turn away from those things that enslave us, and we need to turn to God. David wrote these words in Psalm 66. Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he did for me. For I cried out to him for help, praising him as I spoke. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God did listen. He paid attention to my prayer. Praise God who did not ignore my prayer or withdraw his unfailing love from me. Our confession of sin must be continual because we continue to do wrong. But true confession requires us to listen to God and to want to stop doing what is wrong. David confessed his sin and prayed. When we refuse to repent or when we harbor and cherish certain sins, we place a wall between us and God. We may not be able to remember every sin that we've ever committed, but our attitude should be one of confession and obedience. 1 John 1 verse 9 assures us If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. What is it this morning that's keeping you from serving God fully? Confess it to him. God can forgive you. Repent of it to him. God can guide you away from it. Confess that he's the Christ, the son of the living God. And he will be your Lord. Submit to the waters of baptism, bearing the old man, being raised to a new life, filled with the Holy Spirit. Live a life of faithfulness until he calls you home. And praise him for eternity, because he is worthy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for you this morning and for who you are. And for all you've done for each one of us. And for who you are to each one of us. Lord, you've given us the opportunity not only for forgiveness of our sins and the hope and promise of heaven and for eternity, but Lord, you've promised us your Son. You promised to meet every need according to his riches. Lord, we each have things that we struggle with. Let us today turn those things over to you. Confess those things to you. Repent of those things. And let you fill us with your power. 
so that you can overcome those things that we cannot. Lord, let us start today living in a faithful life for you because you are indeed worthy of all praise and all glory. You've created us. You've knit us in our mother's womb. And you've got a purpose for each one of us. Show us that purpose. Let us be faithful until you call us home. Lord, we love you and we praise you this morning and in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. is his faithfulness. Uh, this week, several announcements up there, elders meeting today, uh, morning prayer group at 630. That's been going really well. Uh, Donnie, I'll like to see you there tomorrow. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> I, I like to, I like to, Donnie's already left the, left the house by that time, I know. <laughs> Love you, Donnie. <laughs> um, next week is Bible school. Not this coming week, but the following week, sign-up sheet is out in the, in the foyer. Uh, anything I need to add to that, Linda? Uh, just got a lot of mics on there. Okay. Make sure if you're coming, <coughs> excuse me, make sure if you're coming to the dinner on the 26th, mm-hmm. that's put your name in. Whether you think you might be coming or if you are coming, yeah. please put it there so we make sure we have it. Yeah. Yep. June 26th is our anniversary Sunday. Uh, sign up sheet out there. We just want to make sure we have enough chicken, food, things like that for everybody. So make sure you put your If you think you're coming, go ahead and put your name on there. Jamie. Okay, that's this Friday. Okay, now this coming Friday they'll be decorating for VBS. What time, Jamie? 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Okay. Uh, June 25th, 
6 o'clock, there'll be a concert with Promised Land Quartet and 3 and 1 Quartet. There's some flyers out on the table on your way out. Uh, if you want to pick one of those up and hang up in the store, uh, that'd be great. We'll have a good crowd that night. I think that's all we have. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your love and for your presence in our lives each day. Lord, we just love you and pray that you would continue to put people in our path that we can share the good news of salvation through your Son with this coming week. Father, give us boldness in our speech, but also give us grace that we could show the love and compassion of your Son. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.